All right, guys, welcome back to the Steel Forum. And today we have a business discussion about detailing in general. Not too much SDS2 talk in this one. So if you are just a general detailer, please listen along. We talk about a lot of the challenges that people have when estimating detailing work, uh, the price by pound, price by riser, price by whatever else things that they have and, and why you should avoid those, and how to negotiate with your customers in a way that ends you ends up with everybody, but mostly you, feeling like they got the best out of it. All that today, steel pull. All right, Matt, welcome back to the Steel Forum. As you know, we've had an exciting couple months. Uh, January is supposed to be a particularly exciting month, uh, but we won't talk about that too much. I, I think our most of our user base anyways knows kind of why that is, what's going on there. Uh, but we've, we're, we're starting to get to the point now where we're trying to wrap up projects, right? Like, and it's, yeah. it's all of these projects that just never die. And it's, it's, it's almost like an epidemic, right? Like we got a project back with field measurements. I mean, this, this job we had long considered dead, just dead, right? Mm -hmm. We're, it's okay. It, we're done with it, right? We issued the drawings for basic, for fabrication a full year and a half ago. And then just br you know, brought it back with field measurements. So, um, you know. You're talking about that miscellaneous job? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Okay. And, you know, we've got another one that was a rush job. It started in January of last year. And, you know, a couple weeks into it, we're getting, you know, chewed out because, oh, how am I supposed to get to the field? And they're still revising it and changing things. It's the nature, yep. right? Well, like, we hired a guy and he's made a career out of that job. He's been on it all year. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So, but it's all right, I guess. Um, so one of the things I wanted to talk about was uh, a, a little bit of our estimating procedures and billing and, and kind of all that, uh, what's, what's known as, you know, generally in business is the back end. You know, what, what do we do outside of production? This is in response to a question that we got from one of the, the viewers. Basically, he's been what we call, you know, what we generally refer to as a basement detailer. He's, he's on his own. He was working in house for a fabricator for a while. And he decided, you know, I want to work from home. I've got this one good customer who will keep me busy and it's enough. It's, it, it's plenty. And when I say basement detailer, that's not a pejorative, right? Like there's no problem with being a basement detailer. You're paying your bills and you're living a great life. You're on your own, you have a quiet space, you work when you want to, it's fantastic. But the problem that he came to us with is kind of the classic problem for these type of detailers, is all of a sudden there was a price that was no longer per ton. They got into a more complex job with more revisions, more RFIs, more field measurements, they sent the bill for what they expected to be paid. And now the fabricator doesn't want to pay that much. They feel like they're being taken for a ride. So was, let me ask you, cause I, I'm not too familiar with this uh, specific issue. Did this person have a contract in place or an agreement before beginning work on the job? No, 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 no contract no quote. Um, and I, honestly, with a lot of these, they, they don't even know the first thing. And again, not in a, a kind of sending way about putting a price on a job. So I wanted to talk a little bit about your thoughts on it. And uh, of course, share my thoughts on it too, because you can't shut me up. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I mean, to me, if you don't have a contract, it's, that's, 
that's just a disaster looking for a place to happen. I mean, anyone that operates on just a handshake and a, you know, everyone will, it'll all work out. Okay. That's you're, you're just begging for problems. And, you know, it, it sounds like this one has come to a head essentially. Right. This guy is probably at a crossroads. And unfortunately we got the email months ago. Uh, so it may have already worked itself out. But the problem is one that the detailing community constantly faces. And it comes down to two things. Uh, contract, obviously, which is a part that we're talking about now. And then just how do you price detailing? And that's uh, how do you price detailing is the conversation that we have over and over at every conference that we go to, every place that we meet detailers. Yeah. Uh, you know, we, and the thing that we keep hearing people do is they price by ton. And I could, I can never wrap my head around how anyone can make that a business model because a ton of W eight by tens and a ton of 21 by 44s are very different tons. Yep. You know, how complex is that steel to draw? And I've also heard people say, well, you know, we do it by the sheet or by the detail. How do you know at right. bid time how many of those are going to combine or not? Right. I can fill a sheet with filler beams in five minutes and right. one with a, a radius stair in 16 hours. Right. It's and entirely- if you're talking, and now you can go the other way with it. If you're talking about how much white space do you allow? Well, if it's per sheet, maybe I can only fit two filler beams on a 24 by 36 because I was leaving room for un- unexpected revisions, you know? Yeah. We, I mean, you, we could talk literally. Way for hours about every system that starts with the words I price by and doesn't end in man hours. Right. (laughs) That's it. That's the the end of it. Whatever your system is in the end, it's how many hours is it going to take you to do? Because that's all we have to sell is our labor. That's it. Right. Right. We're just selling our time. So you have to put a price on your time and then figure out how much time you need to do that. Yeah. And I've always worked in what I call man weeks. Any detailer who should be in a position of estimating can look at a project and tell you how many weeks it will take to do. And sometimes it's a fraction fraction of the week. It's a fifth of a week or, you know, two, three days. But generally, I like to think of it in weeks. And then is it one or two person, you know, one or two people multiplied by your you know, desired or needed, not even desired, your needed rate to get it done. And that's it. You've got your calculation for how, right. for how much to charge for that. Right. And then when it comes time to figure out the actual schedule, if you think it's going to take two weeks and they're only allowing one, then you know you need to put two people on it. Yep. So you just, you multiply, you know, or you just divide rather uh, against how many weeks you need to get it done per the schedule versus what you thought one person could do it in by themselves. And now you know how many people you need to throw at that job as well. And one of the things, you know, the jokes that I like to make constantly is people have all of these systems in place. They have spreadsheets, they have, they, they count how many beams there are and then how many connections there are and how many sections there are. And then they multi, they use a multiplier at the end of it they figure out a multiplier well let me tell you what that multiplier is nonsense that is just you just made that up and that's okay you know what i mean that's it's fine because if you talk to the greatest detailing firms around and you you get their estimator a couple drinks in they're going to tell you almost all of them are going to tell you that in the end it's just a guess it's just a guess It's, it, it, it's a guess not based on tons. It's not based on how many pages I think it's going to, how long am I going to be working on this stupid thing before it's done? Yep. Yep. That's, that's all it ever boils down to is it, it's just a guess. And all you're really trying to do is figure out how to get paid for the time you're going to spend. Yeah. And any, any system that you have to derive that, is just BS numbers that you're throwing at it and hoping to make yourself feel enough. better. Right? right. To make yourself feel like you did something scientific, but it yeah. really just boiled down to how long will it take me? Honestly, I can, I can spend three hours estimating a job or I can spend 30 hours estimating a job. 
the numbers come out about the same in the end. You know, sometimes I'll miss something or I'll, I'll misunderstand the, the, the complexity of it. But with the amount of bids that detailers have to do, right, because a, a lot of contractors send you bid after bid after bid and don't award work, you have to be realistic about it. And don't, don't price yourself too low. Don't, don't do it. Uh, something I, I wanted to talk about too is the customer's different understanding between what I bid and what they want. We've got a specific job right now where we're working on some roof rails and the, the architectural drawings show a railing going into a wall around the perimeter of this roof. No problem. Okay. It's $3,000. It's nowhere near $3,000, but $3,000. And then they come back and they start sending sketches. Well, I want to use a flange and I want them to be removable and to penetrate and they have to be spaced at precisely this to miss this. Okay, none of that was what was shown in the contract drawings. All I had was a section and everything else you've dreamed up is, is more complicated than that. So... It, it, it's got to be a change. You have X in your price and you want Y. Don't, don't be shy about it. You just can't be. If, if you're not willing to ask for money when people are asking you to do more work, you're not going to be successful in this business. You'll be everybody's friend, but you'll be broken out of business within a couple of years. Yeah. I, I would say that. And bitter. Right, right. Because every time Very somebody asks you to do something and you, you think the end of their sentence is always a silent for free, but it's not. It's, I need this thing. There are things you should do for free as part of your base price, and there are things you should not. And the line is, could you have reasonably expected this at bid time? Right. If you're bidding a right. stair, you need to know that there are going to be field measurements. Right. So you're right. going to have to incorporate those. But once you incorporate those once, you don't get, okay, I'm going to check this and release it for fabrication. And then two months later, you bring me different, you know, bring me field measurements. If you want it released for fabrication, I need the field measurements in advance. If I release it for fabrication, I'll check. Then you bring me new field measurements. I got to bill you. Um, and that, that brings us to a topic that we, we started to talk about off camera was some of the struggles that we've had with model checking. Yes. Yeah. So, you know, we, we've been using MDM kind of on and off for about a year now. Um, and it's, it's both been a blessing and a curse for us. Um, we have caught some mistakes that would have been very embarrassing to let them go out the door, even for approval, just mm -hmm. things that were missed, incorrect beam section sizes, things like that, that, you know, yeah, we would have caught it on checking, but we got the check done before it went out for approval. So, yay. <clears throat> you get it back from approval. And if the design team had just finished their jobs before we started work, then we could have just put that job in for fabrication and it would have been perfect. Everything like you would expect. But the reality is they decided to change finished floor across the board. All elevations are upset, which screws up all of your vertical braces. It screws up all of your columns and we had to move all of the beams, which means they all reprocess. And, you know, if you've, if you've ever worked with SDS for any period of time and you think that all of your connections are safe, you're kidding yourself. Yeah. You know those can jiggle on you at any moment, so you're going to need to review them. And things got moved around. They got shifted and shuffled, you know, a couple inches here and there. They just, they, the design team couldn't resist. They had to move some beams, even if it's just an inch here and there. So now we're all the way back to square one. We have to do the pre-check. We have to make sure that the section sizes have been changed correctly, that they're still right, the connections are good, the locations are right, elevations are fixed, all of that. You're, you're starting your check over. And 
we had already checked the job. So we had built the job out additionally for checking, essentially. So typically when we bill things, we bill out to 80% when it goes out for approval. Now we had billed it to 90% when it went out for approval. So now when we need to revise it, we not only need to charge for the time that we're going to spend to fix it, but we're going to need to charge more time to recheck the entire job. Customer doesn't see it that way. Why should I have to pay for checking? Checking was included in my price. They don't care that you've already checked it. Right. And so now we, we, we've, we've got the argument and it, it seems that every job for some reason that we did with MDM this year, those were the jobs that came back 100% revised. Just every job we get is 100% revised. Yeah, but these were above and beyond. I mean, we don't usually see the floor changes its elevation, you know, or reshuffle all of the beams in an area. Yeah. There's revisions, but usually it's around the perimeter. We want to tweak the poor stops or something like that. Not, we're going to fundamentally revise the building out from under you. Yeah. Um, so one of the things I think that's really crucial, and I think one of the places where most detailers who are detailers first and businessmen, business people, second, if ever, fail, is being able to have tough conversations without becoming emotionally involved like emotionally excited it's it i mean it's a challenge it's it's a it's a learned skill but it's so important in these conversations and one of the things they do frequently is assume what the other party is thinking is the worst possible thing and right. the email is particularly vicious with this where you read an email it doesn't matter what the email says you're going to interpret it in the worst possible tone. Yep. You're going to assume they're being snarky, sarcastic, whatever. And yeah, t tone is impossible to convey an email and it's a huge breakdown of communication especially in today's business because of that. Yeah. Yeah. And it's it's, it's not just business that happens in, in personal stuff all the time and you have to be prepared to to back down off of stuff and, and say listen I I think you're reading a tone that doesn't exist. I'm not, I'm not saying that I'm not doing that. I'm not, you know, even if you are emotionally involved, you should appear to not be because it doesn't help the situation when you start shouting at people, you know, even if they're shouting at you, the most frustrating to somebody who's thing to somebody who's shouting at you is to be responded to in a calm, cold, Stay deliberate calm. manner. Yeah. But you can't, you can't be afraid of it. I mean, we've all not picked up the phone once or twice because we weren't emotionally prepared to have that hard conversation right then. But you do have to rip that Band-Aid off eventually. And not weeks later, you know, within that day, unless it's a particularly pernicious day, just, just get it done. You feel so much better because the conversation in your head that you have is almost always worse than the actual conversation that happens. Yep. Almost always. Almost always. Yeah. It's, you know, there, there have been times when a customer was certain that we screwed this up and we did everything wrong. And a, just a calm explanation of the facts about here's the state of the contract drawings and we received this and we received that and that came after this. So avoided that you lay it out, stay calm and you, you'll, you'll do better. Even if you don't win, you end up in a better situation than you would have if you, you know, got or let them know that you got emotional. We're all emotional. It's, it's our money. It's our livelihoods. It's the food that we put on our family's table. You should be emotional, but use it as a power, not a weakness. Right. It's how you respond to that anger that, you know, you can either give them power or you can reserve the power for yourself. And when you just start flipping out on somebody, you're giving them that power. And it's just the because same. Now you're not only wrong, but you're unreasonable as far as they're concerned. 
and it's the same thing with an employee employer relationship, you know, uh, more than a few detailers have who have managers or I can't, not many detailers even have managers, but have bosses who have no concept of what it is that's going on and make ridiculous assumptions, ridiculous requests. And in those conversations, if you can remain calm, collected, you're going to increase your value overall. All right. So you've got a customer that you've been working with for a while under no contract. It's been a handshake relationship of we'll send you the job, you send us the drawings and a bill. And now that relationship for the first time has broken down. What are the, the first steps that you take? So I think the first step that you want to take at that point is kind of stop everything and let's, mm-hmm. let's discuss this. Let's negotiate. You know, kind of try to feel them out for where they think is going to be a reasonable amount. And at that point, you know, you, you can use whatever negotiating tactics you may have at your disposal. Use some kind of an extreme anchor, which you've probably already done essentially by throwing out your invoice. Um, but try to negotiate a best price to get through the situation where you can keep the business relationship intact. Because unless we're talking about somebody is trying to sink you to the tune of tens of thousands of dollars, you can probably eat this one bad deal or at least reduce it to a minimally bad deal as much as possible. But Maintain not without, a relationship. Not without, right. Not without that quid pro quo right. of I'm doing this one in an exchange X. Right. But going forward, you've got to have contracts. I mean, it, it, this is a disaster that was waiting to happen. It has happened and it will happen again. And you need to have contracts. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, they're, they're, they're critical. They're just a must. It's, you have to be able to use a contract. Is, it, I mean, that's what's going to decide what do you owe on the contract? What do you owe on the job as far as drawings? What are you going to provide your deliverables? What formats of files? What's your schedule looking like? And what's expected of the customer? When do they need to pay you? What, what's the, the terms of payment as far as the breakdown along the job? How much do they need to pay you and when? And what happens when something goes wrong? It, it all needs to be in there. How are change orders dealt with? What happens when there's a delay? How is delay to be handled? And I mean, there's no one right solution. Everyone's going to have their own contract. And you're going to need to negotiate that contract. But it's important to have one so that everybody's got a set of rules to play by for that job. So what do you think is going to happen? What's the response going to be from a fabricator? It's the first time, all of a sudden, this has all been, always been a handshake agreement. We're buddies, et cetera, et cetera. And then the next time, they're issued a quote that comes with a contract that is expected to be signed and returned. I mean, it, it's going to depend on some of the uh, external variables there. Like, is this somebody that you have been personally friends with outside of work? Because that could be something that could come up. But um, I mean, it's really in how you, uh, how you handle it, you know, to say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm trying to branch out. I need to kind of keep this in order. This is something that my attorney suggested that I do for all projects, not just yours. That's kind of a, a, a good smoother yep. of we, issues. We use that one is, frequently. Yep. Blame somebody this else. This is what I do for everyone. It was suggested by this authority that I, I submit to, and it's not just you. Everybody's going to sign my contract. We should know? go back for just a second and, and address a term that you used, uh, which was anchor. Uh, because Mm -hmm. some of the people might not understand the concept of anchoring in general. Could you go into that a little bit? So this is a a negotiating tactic that I picked up after reading uh, Chris Voss's book, Never Split the Difference, Negotiating Mm -hmm. Like Your Life Depends on It. Mm -hmm. Fantastic read, by the way. Anyone in business should read it. Oh, shut up. (laughs) Well, not for I I agree you should read it, but... Yeah, it... If you already have a business background, a lot of it is just going to sound like common sense to you. But for people that don't, it, you really should pick that up and understand a lot of what's going on there. I mean, there's a lot of things that you do without realizing it that are already in that book. 
Yeah, I would. I would just. I wish there was an abridged copy of that book. Get there's the audio book. There's a lot of storytelling in that book that is not necessary to get to the crux. That's true. There's, but I I, I find that that helps. Bring it home. Kind of drive some points home, but it, you get it in an audio book. You can put it on while you're working, and you'll be through it in a day. Yeah, it's better than listen to us. Absolutely. So. <laughs> So one of the things that he talks about is having an extreme anchor point. So rather than trying to throw out the value you're trying to get to, and then you know, you're know you going to wind up having to negotiate away from that point, you throw out an extreme absurd amount of money one way or the other. But that- this, we have to talk a little bit about the simple psychological thing that is anchoring and pricing. So it's the reason that when you go to Kohl's, it says this sweater is $135 marked down to $40. Exactly. No matter how much you know in your head that that's a $20 sweater marked up to $40 and then marked up to $175. When you see that price of $140, your brain at anchors to the fact that that sweater is worth $140. And so the basic concept is you want to put the value that you want assigned to something in your opponent's, your you know co-negotiator head as soon as possible. Don't let them throw out the first number, right? You want to throw out the first number. And, you know, well, it- if you're forced to go first, you want to throw out an extreme number so that you can negotiate back to your desired number. Mm-hmm. Would be the way of it. But yeah, that, and that gives you a chance to kind of shock the system a little bit, so it throws their expectations off. So if they think that they should be able to get something for a hundred dollars, and you think you should be able to get it for two hundred, if you say if you start with two hundred, you're going to be looking at one twenty-five to one seventy-five. You're not getting your two hundred for sure, right? But if you start off with 400, you may get 250. Yep. And now you're even better off than you originally hoped. And they feel like they're getting a deal. Right. And even if, if, if their bid was $1,500, if they put $1,500 for estimating, and your first quote, and this is for somebody who is a negotiator, okay? Most fabricators aren't those people. You give them a quote, and it's either low, and they'll take it, or it's within their budget and they'll take it or it's not and they won't give you the job. This is a conversation for those people who like to negotiate a bid. And it's a different conversation. You need to feel out these people over the course of a couple jobs because if you do, you know, what you call extreme anchoring as your bid with a, you know, what I call anyways, an honest fabricator, then you're just not going to get the job because it, right, it's, right. It it doesn't work for a straight up bid, but it works for a negotiation. Yeah, and bidding is not necessarily a negotiation. And like you said, a lot of times when you submit a bid, you're one of fifty people, and they just put them in order from lowest to highest and pick the lowest, and they're done. Right. They don't care what the value add is on that cust if, of that detailer if they're going to provide better work, more work, better turnaround time greater service, greater file formats, whatever. It's were you the low price and that's all they care about. Yeah. And And one of the things you need to understand too is uh, fabricators a lot of times pull this move where they're like, we got your price. It was $30,000, but we got this other guy's price. That's $15,000. We'd like to use you. Do you think you can come down to $15,000? And what you need to remember about that conversation are the words, we'd like to use you. That's right. their way of saying, you're worth more to us. So make now, them pay for that. Also, that is use of an extreme anchor. What they're doing is an attempt to negotiate your price down by shocking you into thinking, oh, somebody thinks this is worth 15000 I should come down. Yeah. And they may not have anybody lined up lower. They could just be trying to get your price down because you're the only person they ask to bid it. You don't know who else is bidding that job. And or even not, if you are the low price right. out of 10, they want to knock it down even more because they set it into their uh, budget you know, for the job. When they bid it, they thought, oh, it'll be $20,000 for this to be drawn. And then everybody comes in 30 grand and up. Right. Right. And 
I, I'm not even saying that we don't miss, right? I've, I've bid jobs and then with a half an hour, I thought, what the heck was I thinking? That is way too much money for that job. Like, it's, it's just like engineering where engineers do this thing where they have a safety factor and then they have a safety factor and then a multiplier and then a, I'm not really sure, so I'll multiply again thing. And every once in a while, you get done with a bid and you've done that. And then you get to the end of it, you, you send out the bid and you, you know, it, bells start going off in your head. I, I dropped the ball on that one. I screwed it up. If you screwed it up, just admit, I, I screwed it up. My price is too high. Here it is. But something we've run into is the, the consummate negotiator. Doesn't matter what your bid is, every single time they want it to change. Right. If, if you've never been the low bid with, with your customer, they're just trying to get things for free. So all you do with that customer is you add onto your price whatever they're going to ask you to take back off so that you end up at the same amount and a little bit more because screw you for the headache of the negotiation every time. Yep. And for the, the insult. Right. Right. Yeah. We, we did that and we wound up making more money off them for quite a while. Yeah. It's, at some point it does become insulting for you to constantly say my work is worth X and they say, Oh no, it's only worth 75% of X. Okay. No, we're here. We're all about an honest negotiation. But if, if all you're trying to do is take money out of my pocket, Nope, I'm, I'm not interested in that. Yep. Yeah. I, it, it was pretty consistent too. It was always about, 75% of whatever our price was like they just applied that figure. Maybe they rounded one way or the other, but it was always rounding down about 25% off from whatever our price was. Yeah. And to the person's credit, when we just said no, they, they didn't come back. Right. Like, I mean with other bids, but they didn't come back with that bid and say, well, okay, we'll do it with you anyways. So, but no, my work is that what I price something at is really what I need to make to do that job. Yeah. Well, in, in just to kind of follow up a little bit more on that, what they did do was they, they came back later after they had used overseas detailers for a while and said, yeah. we'd really like to go back to working with you. So they, they found their cheaper solution and they wound up paying for it. Like right. anyone. I was going to say the short term cheaper solution. Yeah. And, in, in detailing, that's almost never the long-term solution. Yeah, not so much. Anyone that's invested the time in training and they've bought the software and they're actually people that operate with integrity, they're going to charge you a fair rate. Yeah. And anyone that's charging you less, you really should ask yourself why. Right. Uh, I What's lacking here? Right. Is your software pirate? Are you an illegal, illegally operating entity? Are you some overseas thing that's not paying people what they should be paid? And Well, I, I think for a fair number of detailers, they just don't value themselves. That's another one. Yeah. You know, they, they just think they left company making $35 an hour, so they should bill $35 an hour. And they, that figure is not a joke it's not an exaggeration there are people working on their own right now probably some of them are listening who are billing 35 dollars an hour for their work i i know of at least one that's billing 20 i don't care and, where you live yeah it's mm. forget it right it i mean you you have to understand if, if you're the guy that's doing that that there's more to it than just your time as far as a company goes, you know, a company has to pay its employees, which would be you, but then they also have to pay for their software. They have to pay for their lights, their heat, their, um, their mortgage on the building. You know, if, if they've got sales, uh, remote team. services, what's right. that sales? Yeah. yeah. Like you've got to pay, you, you know, you have to recoup your money that you spend bidding jobs. There's a lot of overhead that goes into business. Yep. You get to roll that into your rate. 
you, you twenty dollars or thirty dollars an hour get is to. not enough. You yeah. have to. <laughs> you have to. And with with software support rates going up, it's we're paying a lot. I mean, we've got probably the cheapest cloud solution that exists, right? Yes. And we, it, it still costs money for every one of our employees. It's 30 cents an hour or, you know, probably even up to 50 cents an hour on top of their paycheck that we have to pay to keep them in the cloud. You know, it's probably not quite 50 cents, but it's, it's added onto that rate. And the, all those things, unemployment insurance, general liability insurance, having an accountant, doing the taxes, buying a new monitor, all of that stuff has to get rolled into that rate. And the other thing that gets, has to get rolled into the rate is the, the, the back charges, the collection, the, all of that stuff at the end of the year you have to take what you wanted to make at the end of your first year and divide it by how many hours you worked in your first year. And that's it. That's how much you need to make. And I, I, I think you should still charge more than that. Right? You, you should have, you should always be growing and continuing to expand and, and things like that. Right. But that's the minimum. And until you've done the first year, I don't think you can really put a calculation on it other than to just look what the rest of the industry is doing. But right. And you know, when you look at what you, what you can charge for an hour too, it also depends on how efficient you are. Mm -hmm. You know, we can charge a lot more per hour because we're going to get a lot more done in that same hour. Right. If you are hand drawing something versus somebody using 3D modeling software with parametrics and custom members and components and everything is automated and you can export all the files in the world. You're going to get to charge a lot more per hour because you're going to get so much more done with that system. Right. You know, it, it's like a guy with a shovel standing next to a guy in a bulldozer and the guy with the yeah. shovel says, I'll work for 50 cents hour, an hour less than he will. Great. Right. <laughs> I, I bet I'll save a whole bunch of money that way. Yeah, so now you have to look at it like, what are you going to charge for the job? And now how do you compare with that guy? You know, if, if it's $1,000 either way, he's going to spend five minutes and you're going to spend the next two days. He wins. Yeah, absolutely. He's going to be able to afford more bulldozers at the end of the month. Right. And that's, I mean, that's legitimately a factor. It's how many bulldozers do you need? And if... You know, we all know SDS2 support rates are going up. Um, so that means we have to increase our rates to compensate for that. None of that money should be coming out of your pocket at all. Now, eventually, if we keep adding that onto our employees, you know, our, our customers' bills, our customers are going to start using people who are using other software. And that's really the argument that needs to be made with with SDS2 is it, it's not, I don't feel like I'm paying too much. It's that I, you're not competitive. This compared to what the competition is charging is disproportionate and I can't compete. What did you do? Apparently, I activated my Alexa, the one that I have on my desk, so I can say steel shapes. What is ah. the flange width of W14 by 22? And it'll say the flange width of W14 by 22 is four inches. So, you know. Um. So what else is uh, some valuable advice for somebody making that jump from? junior to or junior that's such a patronizing term um employee to employer yes to employee to becoming a business owner yes i mean you, you've got to make sure that your contracts are good 
you've got to make sure that you've got some, some, at least some bare bones negotiating skills. Um, understanding how you're going to get paid and what you need to do with that money as it comes in. I mean, having a basic understanding of generally accepted accounting principles or gap, that's a good thing to bring to the table. Um, or being able to subcontract don't or subcontract and be honest with yourself. If you're not the kind of person who is going to keep track of those invoices, get them out on time, get, keep track of change orders, get somebody to do it for you. Yeah. Hire a bookkeeper. The amount of people I know who are leaving four times a bookkeeper salary on the desk every year because they just didn't bill their change orders or their invoices or just didn't keep things straight is staggering. And they'll admit it to you too. Oh yeah. Yeah, I know. I should really do something about it. Well, do, do something. <laughs> don't, yeah, I mean, you don't have to hire one full time there. It's, it's 2020. Yeah. About, I want to say about five years ago, we started differentiating in our accounting, the income between sales and change orders so that we could see how much of our income comes from straight billing versus how much comes from after the fact change orders. And since we've started tracking that, we found that about 25% of our income is change order money. That's a lot to leave on the table if you're not bothering to bill for change orders. Yeah, yeah that fabricator is going to come back to you Every time you'll never not have work, but you'll always be poor. Yeah. You'll never afford an upgrade. You'll never afford another license, another employee. And that's, uh, that's not deliberate either. I, I don't think it, maybe one of our customers mm -hmm. would say, Oh, well, they're too aggressive. They, they want change orders for too much, but that's just cause that person's crazy. All right. So you got bookkeeping. What about IT? We, I've, I've been having conversations with a, a particular... I, IT is kind of in your department, so why don't you tell us what, uh, what sort of IT expectations should a new business owner be looking for? I got to say, right off the bat, if, if you're looking to grow, be prepared to build up your cloud infrastructure. I don't... I, I really... I, I hate to say it, but don't just jump over to... to Cloud Synergistics or Edge, SDS Edge, it's it's overpriced. It's not delivering what it can be. It's not as resilient uh, as, it, as it needs to be. It's everything you would expect from a monopoly. Yes, yes, that is, <laughs> that's true. And you don't have to be an IT expert. There's a great service um, or a great website. It's called Fiverr, F-I-V-E-R-R. -E -R. If you just Google it, you'll find it where you can find IT people, you tell them what you need done, and a whole bunch of qualified subcontractors will come to you with either a proposal or you can set a maximum price and say, this is what I need. And it has been a large part of how we've been successful in IT is when we get over our head, we just hire it out. We find somebody and we pay them a respectable rate. You know, they're, they're usually the equivalent of a moonlight detailer, but for IT. And they'll come in, they'll set up what you need. They're, they're experts in that space. And then they can just walk away. Our, our system needs zero day-to-day -day maintenance. The, maybe once a month is all we ever need to talk to an IT person. Now, I can generally handle those tasks because I'm fairly IT fluent. But even outside of that, we would still be saving bank by doing our brew your own solution and it there, there's no secret to it there's no complex convoluted it's easy to set up once it's set up it's there for you when you want it you don't have to use it all the time it's it, it's great but the other thing is a lot of people really just go absolutely crazy building their computers it, it, it seems like there's two extremes and almost nobody in the middle People who spend their entire bank going to, you know, a, a, this well-established computer manufacturer 
and saying, uh, you know, I just want the top of the end or top of the line gaming system. Well, that's going to cost you. It's going to cost you, it's going to have a comma and at least three in front of that comma. <laughs> and you don't need to say you're going to drop two to $10,000 on that system, depending on how crazy you decide to go. Yeah. And if you, if you use a website, like uh, I'll recommend I buy power, um, and it's I B U Y P O W E R. They'll, it, it, it's like having, you know, your nephew build the, the system for you, but you pick out the parts. It's done professionally. You don't have to take one of their pre-built things. You select the components because a gaming rig is too powerful. Like a true gaming rig is more than you need, but it's also less than you need. It's not as processor heavy as something that you want for detailing. Uh, it's got too much graphics card. It, SDS2, AutoCAD, Tecla, none of them are using the graphics card the way that you expect or to the level that you expect. Even we do video rendering and it, it just doesn't make use of the graphics card as much. So if, if you want a game on your system, sure, buy that video card. But otherwise, 150, 200 bucks for a video card, you're, you're more than capable. Just make sure it's got the right parts on it. Um, so those are, I mean, some of the beginning hints of, of how to do it. But don't buy off the shelf. Absolutely don't do that. Oh, no. Yeah. Oh, no. That will, that will be overpriced. It will not in any way, shape, or form conform to what you're looking for. And you will have loads of extra software that just suck that will drain the system of its resources it has. Yeah. And the other thing is that those systems so frequently aren't built to be repaired or upgraded. Mm -hmm. I've had the one that I'm using right now. We've upgraded it, I think just once, really, with a significant upgrade. And we've had it for six years now. And that's a long time. It's a long time world. for computer life. Yeah, that is a long time. And it still today, it is a top-of-the-line machine. And we have not spent anywhere near top of the line money on it. Yeah. Uh, the one that, the one that I'm running is, I think it's about the same age. We've thrown some extra memory cards in it. We've upgraded it from spinning hard drives to SSDs yeah. and replaced the case fans a couple of times. We've smoked more case fans than anything else. Just, you know, they're the first things to die, but, you, you, that, that computer lasts. It's not like, you know, the early 2000s where every other day they're coming out with the new theoretically fastest can possibly be processor. They, they sort of, they sold that a lot. You know, every six months they'd come out with the new Pentium or whatever. And, and the, the technology has matured. There's not a lot of improvement month to month, even year to year at this point. So you can buy a solid system. It doesn't cost you a fortune and it can last you a long time. And I mean, I'm running two 4K monitors plus two 1080Ps. I can do recording, I can do SDS, Bluebeam, and I can game on here and watch TV like an ADD psychopath all the time, and it's fine. Yeah, short of, the, pretty much the only time my computer ever bogs down is rendering. Yeah, it's rendering videos, that's yeah, about it. That's it. Uh, and it was important you said videos, because SDS too, it's not doing it. It's not. <laughs> Still. There are so many other factors in bottlenecks and what SDS2 does. When you're talking about big projects, it's almost always the hard drive speed. Yep, and it's read-write speed with SDS. That's, yeah. that's its big thing. It's something that they need to fix within their software, and it's something they are working on. Um, pretty diligently, I've, I've seen a couple times the, the demonstrations of it, and it's not quite as efficient as it needs to be yet, but they're moving in the right direction there. So yeah. that's, it's, it's improving. Yeah. Yeah. That's exciting. So, all right, we should wrap up. We've got some exciting stuff coming this month. Once we get our hands, our grubby little hands on SDS 2 2020, hopefully it'll be in January. Um, we'll, uh, we'll unbox it. We'll probably do a live video of us straight from install and uh, we'll, we'll laugh and cry with all you and hopefully be super excited to uh, to see what they've got. So that's it for today. Today, we hope we have been helpful to you in all of your bidding and business questions. 
didn't talk much about in and outs of detailing, but we did talk about business today. So as always, if you have any questions, let us know down in those comments. Hit the subscribe button, and we'll see you back here on The Steel Farm.